Anandan, good morning. Morning. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity. Sure. We wanted to engage with you to understand what should be the path forward for India Post Payments Bank and how do we evolve from here. Uh, Department of Post, as we all know, has a vast network of almost 1,55,000 post offices, 3 lakh postal employees, mm. and this has been around for ages. Uh, we do realize that we would have <coughs> not been able to move forward the way we have without the Aadhaar being and the India stack being there. Today, leveraging the India stack, we have conceptualized and structured the India Post Payment Bank, mm. and which has given us the opportunity to reach to the last mile or the base of the pyramid, mm. who actually have no feature phones or no smartphones and are actually sitting without a device in hand. Mm -hmm. How do we make them inclusive into the economy? And how do we reach out to them? So we have implemented AEPS, and today we've extended the branch infrastructure at the last mile so that any person without a mobile phone can actually access their bank account in an assisted model. Uh, today, almost 1,90,000 postal employees have been equipped with a smartphone and a biometric device, and the rural banking infrastructure has gone up by two and a half times. Now, in the context of this, when we met you last time, you had said that India Post Payment Bank becomes a very important instrument in handling G2P payments. Mm -hmm. uh, again, looking at the report that you had shared for the Reserve Bank on deepening of uh, digital payments, you had indicated that there remain two last mile challenges. Uh, one is in terms of uh, creating a safety net, which is cash in and cash out and provision of cash. And second is digital financial literacy at the last mile of making people understand how to move from cash to digital. Now these two are high investment uh, objectives. Now in the current scenario, how do we create a social and at the same time an economic model to be able to reach and service this 300 million people? So we wanted your views. No, I think uh, Suresh, first of all, let me congratulate you and the India Post Payments Bank because I think you can be and are the most significant player in financial inclusion in India. I think uh, what the India stack and the technologies that are developed over the last decade, be it EKYC or other enabled payment system or UPI or all the other things that uh, were created has been really brought to life by uh, India Post Payments Bank because you have taken this technology which can be delivered over the cloud over a mobile phone and married that to the extraordinary physical network that the post office has and, and really combined this, this combination that has in sort of leapfrog and created a touch point in every village uh, where a postman with a phone and a biometric can do an open account or you know withdraw cash or whatever it is. So I think it's, it's a great achievement. I'm, I must say that I'm very pleased to hear about it. And in some sense, I think to a large extent, you have uh, addressed the cash in, cash out network issue because what we were saying in our report was that you need to have a very ubiquitous cash in cash out network because people must have the confidence that when they need money at a pinch they can go within a few hundred meters and withdraw cash at any time of the day or night once they have that confidence they will leave the money digitally in the bank account because there's no need to take it out what happens today is because they don't have access to a cash in cash out location or because it's far away you have to stand in a queue they just go and empty all the money from their account and then you know you don't really get the benefits of digitization. So I think uh, what you're doing is very important. Uh, I think that uh, uh, also because the interoperability of the cash in cash out network, uh, somebody can have an account in some other bank, get his money in that bank, and he can withdraw it from a postman with a device. So I think that's a, it's a great thing. I just want to add here that actually there are two big flows which uh, we see. One is of course the government to person payments. So we have payments like uh, LPG cash payments or pensions or scholarships or of late there's a whole Kisan program where farmers are getting money, the Nariga payments. So there's a whole G2P dimension of payments. But I think an equally big if not bigger dimension of payments is the uh, remittances. And we see that through IMPS, the immediate payment system of NPCI, which does literally you know, 170,000 crores a month of movement from uh, urban India to rural India. So I think the flows coming into the rural India is both the government to person as well as the remittances. So I think that's what is driving this. Now the reality is that we think that uh, payments uh, or, or uh, payment, digital payment transactions 
the transaction pricing will, will start tending towards zero uh, because more, more and more efficient things will happen. Already UPI is zero transaction cost. And therefore, in the long run, I think you can only make uh, money from volume, because high volume, low cost transactions. And you can make money from other services, uh, digital services that you can deliver through the same network. So the moment you have two, three hundred thousand people with a digitally uh, digital capability, they can offer other rural services. And those you know, could be certificates or education or whatever. And those additional services could be paid for. So one way to, I think, finance the cash-in, cash-out network is, is through additional services. Because the basic payment transaction or debit transaction is going to be very, very uh, low in uh, you know, fee income per transaction. And that's sure. the nature of the market. I think on the issue of digital literacy, I think uh, it's a challenge bigger than uh, uh, the post, uh, your post payments bank. I think the government has to step in. And the government has a huge interest in making India a less cash economy uh, because that brings in efficiency, that brings in uh, you know, lower cost, all kinds of benefits. And uh, you know, the Prime Minister has committed to a low cash economy. So I think the government should make the strategic investment in improving the literacy so that people start doing cashless transactions even in every village. And I think you again have the infrastructure for that because, uh, because of the assisted UPI and other things that you have done. Uh, you know, I always said that you know, we have three different groups of people. We have people, at the, and people mostly think about the people at the top end of the spectrum who have a smartphone, but that's only maybe 300 million people or 400 million people. And they can use all kinds of apps and you know, they can use Google Pay, WhatsApp Pay, Phone Pay. There's so many, Paytm, so many choices. So they are well, they are well served, over served in some sense. Then you have the people who have the feature phones on which UPI does work, but it's not as easy, the ease of use is not the same as that. We need to get them to start using UPI. But the really, if you really want inclusion, you have to look at people who don't have phones. And that's the final 300 million people whom you're serving. Now, while they don't have phones, they do have Aadha numbers. And with the Aadha number, they can open a bank account using a KYC in one of your, in one, in, with one of your post of postman, they can receive the DBT money in that account. They can receive the remittance money into that account. They can withdraw from that using APS. So they're fully served without having a device. However, they need to now get to cashless, where they need to pay in a merchant from the money in their account so that they sure. debit their account and credit the merchant's account. And that is a learning thing. And that's where I think the digital literacy is very important. And I think this is where government has to help. Because I think if we can make merchant payments in rural India cashless, that is the final frontier. Thanks, Nandan. Uh, Nandan, the other one in, in line with that, we are happy to report that we almost over the period of last four to five months, we've got around 12 million customers now, which are largely sitting in this space. Mm. Uh, we've done digital transactions to the tune of 100 billion. Wow. And uh, the good thing, and you've been saying, that this leads us also to the next layer of the stack that uh, and you've been pioneering that thought process to say that with this digital uh, payments and flows we will get a digital footprint yeah so our entire digital footprint is going to be very inclusive in nature so it will go to the last mile so while there's a lot of focus on data privacy and data protection uh, you've been talking a lot about that how can we leverage this data to improve the lives of the people at the last mile and we would like to hear more from you on that and the new account aggregator uh, regulations which have now actually seen the light of day with one entity already getting the license. So we'd like to hear more from you on sure. that. Sure. Uh, rather than saying how we can benefit from the data, I would like to rephrase that saying how can people benefit from their own data. And I think what we are seeing this account aggregator is the last act of a 10 year journey. The first part of the journey was giving everybody an Aadha number, uh, enabling them to get a KYC, open a bank account, and that's been hugely successful in massively causing penetration of uh, financial accounts to you know all the people. The second piece has been addressing payments with AEPS and with UPI, and that again has changed the whole payment uh, business in India. The third and l next act of this journey of the last decade is the account aggregator or the data empowerment architecture. And this in some ways is the most significant because the first two were essentially transactional in nature. How to make accounts, getting an account fast, how to make payments simple. 
this is even bigger in some ways because this is about how can people take advantage of their digital footprint to get benefits for themselves, be it cheaper credit, be it better healthcare, be it better education. And India will be the only country in the world where data is being turned on its head and instead of data being used by companies to sell ads to you sure. or governments to keep eye on you, it, data is now being put in the hands of users so they can do something with it. So that's This goes way beyond issues of protection and privacy, which are obviously required. This actually goes to people being empowered with their own data. And this is an architecture which in India has three parts to it. One is uh, we have to have the technology to make it possible. And all the infrastructure we have, the India stack, Aadhaar, allows you to get data in real time in small consumable amounts from any database uh, with full authentication. So we have that's the technology part of it. Then we need uh, institutions that can do this, and which is why the Reserve Bank, on behalf of all the financial regulators, has come out with the account aggregator thing, and there have been seven in principle licenses, and as you said, one of them has got a full license. Now, account aggregators act on behalf of the consumer. So they don't, while the data flows through them, they can't see it. Sure. So a consumer goes to his account aggregator, and there can be many of them, and says, get my GST records from the GST database, get my income tax records from the income tax database, get my bank statement for the last six months from the bank, and I get them all encrypted, and through my account aggregator, I can give it to one or more lenders, who then will look at that data and use the AI and all that, and say, yes, he's eligible for a loan. So suddenly, millions of small businesses in the rural India, some guy running a grocery store, can now use his digital footprint and get credit, which is the heart of his business growth. And therefore, I think of credit as the killer app of uh, uh, you know, this uh, digitization, because why, when, when small businesses come into the formal economy, people say, oh, they don't want to come in because they will have to pay taxes and all that. Now, that may or may not be true, but when small businesses realize that by being in the digital economy, they're creating digital footprints, and then using the data empowerment architecture, they can leverage those footprints to get cheaper credit, then of course they will join the system. So sure, I think you have sure. to think of it as a way. And because you're at the cutting edge of, of, the, of the last mile, if you can bring, if the post payments bank can bring these capabilities to uh, the uh, small business and then uh, maybe encourage them to start taking loans using that data, then you'll create another revolution in the countryside. So I think this is a very, very important uh, thing and it's uh, first of its kind. Nobody in the world has this. A lot of people haven't even fully understood what, what this means, but I think this is going to be a huge thing in the coming years and you guys are at the forefront of it. And then to that uh, extended question, because you're absolutely right, one is the merchant ecosystem. Now even going back and considering the consumer at the base of the pyramid, who let's say doesn't even have a device, what role do you see IPBB playing over there in this new framework? Because these people will have still friction. How do they get to the account aggregator and give consent and all? No, no. So I, do you see an assisted role for us in enabling that? No, I think it's a great question, and uh, I think there could be an assisted A model. I haven't really thought through all the implications of that. There's also a digital literacy issue and you know, explaining all that and so on. Uh, so I think, but certainly it's, it's a thought, and it has to be done in a very simple way, and maybe taking one use case which is very easy for them to understand, which is very compelling for them and making it happen. So that's one thing. The other thing I think is that we can now start using this also to accelerate bringing them into the digital economy on a self-service mode. Because once people start uh, say getting government payments and start getting uh, you know family payments from their urban uh, spouses, sure. uh, their spouses who are in urban areas, then you have a record of the debits and credits in their bank account. And then you may say, look, I have, I have enough knowledge or I, I think the enough data that you have where you can buy a phone on an EMI basis. So maybe the first product could be an EMI to buy a phone. And then once they buy the phone, then they'll start using it uh, you know, to, to do all this. So I think we have to think creatively and innovatively on how we leverage this last mile we have to bring more and more Indians into the digital economy and participate. And then on another front, we have been, and you've been, again, very articulate in mentioning this, that even our payment and settlement systems have been very uniquely created. 
we've adopted a very open and competitive architecture. So it is just not the banks. It is running under the central bank and the ages of the banks. Yeah. But big tech and uh, technology companies have become a very equal part of the ecosystem in a participative manner. And each one is bringing the best of both worlds and playing to their strengths. Now somewhere we feel that the big tech has seemingly cracked the revenue model because it's very data-based. The banks have traditionally been looking at fees and float as their source of earning. So how do we, as one as even you know a limited uh, banking model or differentiated banking model as payments banks and IPB in particular, how do we create a revenue model while we are working in this participative payment and settlement system? Well, there's no particular evidence that big tech is actually making money from these models because when you look at some of the numbers, they're also having losses. Because they're all investing in market expansion. So uh, that's not, I, I don't think that's happening. I think uh, banks will have to make money from other services. And I think that's why I keep going back to the fact that uh, credit for the small merchant. Now, obviously for India Post Payment Bank, uh, you're limited because your, uh, your current license prohibits you from uh, lending and you can only take deposits up to 1 lakh per account. That's right. But I think one thing I have noticed and this is all public information is that uh, I think the central bank is veering around to giving uh, a, a payment banks a migration path to uh, small finance banks which can lend and uh, I do hope that India Post Payment Bank is also eligible for that or can be asked to be eligible for that and that's a path that you can pursue. And if you can do that, uh, and I see no reason why they shouldn't give you that status, then suddenly you have a vehicle where you can be the lender to the 300 million people out there in rural India. And I think that would be a great place to, and you can you know, definitely provide credit uh, or, you know, efficiently in real time. And I think that would make a huge difference to the economy and to the bank. Sure, Nanda. And then again, when we come to the last mile ecosystem, again, it's about less cash economy and therefore the need to create a digital acceptance ecosystem. Yeah. In your report, you again had mentioned that ecosystem needs to move from prioritizing issuance to acceptance. Yeah. And the whole idea was to enable the creation of an infrastructure. Now, some of the recent uh, rulings where actually MDR has been abolished and banks have been requested to, and RBI has been requested to see how the infrastructure gets created. How do you see the bill getting footed to creating this entire ecosystem? Well, in our report, in the report on uh, deepening the, uh, digital payments that uh, I chaired for the central bank along with very eminent colleagues, uh, did talk about the need of not getting into the pricing, that let market forces handle that and, 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 and make sure that uh, you, know, you may bring in the efficiency. So uh, I don't know what's the exact decision, but I think generally I think there will be a move to at least have some kind of MDR for card transactions and for UPI transactions. However, on APS, uh, I think it's very important that we have a way to reward the acquirers because setting up an acquiring network for APS, whether it is for cash, BC or for merchant, sure. is very uh, cumbersome because it means setting up thousands or millions of you know, small units in different villages. So, I, in fact, I, we argued in the report also that the acquisition, uh, sort of, the, the acquirer should be paid more for, for these functions. Now, that's, you know, how much the acquirer gets paid is an issue between issuers and acquirers. There's a committee of the NPCI, so I don't want to get into all that. But I'm strongly of the view that acquiring banks, and you are a great example of the acquiring bank, should be paid so that there is economic value for you to go out in every nook and corner and offer these services because finally India is going to be more and more a DBT economy. So we, are, we have seen DBT so far in central government sure. services like LPG, uh, you know, Narega, Kisan program, uh, healthcare, pension, those kind of things, education. But we are yet to see LPG in fertilizer. A DBT in fertilizer. We are yet to see DBT in food in a big way, where people have a choice whether they take cash or food. And then once the states start doing DBT, uh, you're going to see DBT in power and water subsidies. Where instead of giving cheap power, you'll give power at market price and give a cash transfer for paying the power bill. So suddenly, if all these things happen, 
then the DBT volumes will go up many fold. And you cannot do this without giving acceptance at your fingertips. A person should be able to walk within a few hundred meters from his house and do a transaction, either cashless or cash, 24 by 7. And that's where I think you come in and I'm all for supporting uh, the acquiring network. Thank you, Nandan. Thanks a lot. That Thanks, was Suresh. very helpful and really does give us a perspective in directionally where should we go. Great. And more primarily also look at the areas around data. Sure. Credit especially being an important Credit part. Credit is the most important data. thing. And I think I personally am in the strong view that the payment bank should really talk to the government and to the central bank and get itself a small bank license. If you don't do it, who else will? You, you have access, you have the customers, you have, you have presence across the country. It's just a, it's a switch for you to turn into a small lending institution, a lender of small loans. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Thanks. a lot. Thanks.